Ladies and gentlemen, we are starting today with a new chapter, and this chapter now brings uh, what we have been discussing at large scale, at orogenic and plate tectonic scale, into a uh, smaller scale context, into the scale of uh, features we actually can see in the field. We are going to talk about the formation of fractures and falls and shear zones and falls in, in mountain belts, in orogenic belts in the field. Uh, the section that you should have a look at is uh, chapter 11 in Marshak's textbook and uh, here we learn something about mountain bells. So why do they form? Why do mountain bells, like here in our example, uh, form uh, in, in nature? Of course, they form because of some plate tectonic activity uh, that uh, applies to practically all younger orogens and uh, with younger I mean everything that is uh, Proterozoic and, and younger. In the Archean, perhaps some uh, different forms of plate tectonics were active, uh, forms of plate tectonics that we have not yet discussed. This will come uh, to you at uh, third year level. So, where do they form? Of course, they form where plate tectonics are most active, and that is at plate margins. At plate margins, at plate margins all these um, tectonic processes that we have been discussing are concentrated in their activity within the interior of large tectonic plates. Uh, very little activity uh, happens and, and uh, no mountain belts will form there. What happens if such uh, rocks uh, are formed in, in form of uh, large mountain belts? We see deformation patterns like these folds that we see here in this picture quite spectacular convoluted folding in uh, layers of rocks and layers is what we need to form folds. Uh, if you have a say a rock like a, a granite body uh, which doesn't have an internal layering so what, what would you fold? Folding is always a process that requires layers and uh, in between layers there should be mechanical differences that is something that triggers folding. If the conditions are right, the physical conditions under which uh, deformation takes place. Deformation and strain are two terms we have to discuss now. Uh, deformation starts with uh, fairly simple features. Here we see, for instance, uh, sedimentary layers that have been eroded more or less in the orientation in which they were once deposited and then became lithified to form solid rocks. Here such uh, layers, similar to those, have been tilted. And this tilting, as you uh, know by now, is uh, can, for instance, be related to the operation of Lystric normal faults. So somewhere here on this side we might find a Lystric normal fault that is responsible for the tilting of this layer. But of course also other processes can uh, lead to such a tilting, such as folding. We could uh, be looking here at a limb of a fold. We will see that later in this section. Here are such folds and uh, the difference between brittle deformation as we will see and folding is that uh, if we have formation of uh, uh, faults for instance, of brittle tectonics like faulting, uh, we will break the rock. Uh, if we form folds like here, we deform the strata without forming fractures. Let's have a look at uh, certain components. Let's uh, take apart the term of uh, deformation. Components of deformation are, for instance, the change in location. You have a certain volume of rock at one position, you move it to another position. This is part of what we call deformation. And also the change in orientation, like tilting of layers, as we have seen in one of the previous slides, involves uh, an element of deformation. But then we have here this uh, feature, the change in shape. That is what is typically referred to as strain. And strain is oh, probably the most uh, important component of, of deformation. But uh, deformation and strain are not synonymous. Strain refers only to the change of shape. You do not have to have changes in location or changes in orientation necessarily. But uh, together with rotation and displacement, the strain would uh, apply to the term deformation. How can we measure strain, so the change in shape? Uh, 
Uh, certainly it is most easily done if we know what a certain rock or a part of a rock, a marker in a rock has looked like uh, before strain took place. And this could be, for instance, a, a fossil. A fossil that is uh, well known in its shape, in its uh, aspect ratio and uh, whole uh, features that we see here from undeformed sedimentary rocks where this fossil got deposited, uh, lithified and uh, and can be found in its original shape. If such a, a shape is changed in a rock and we still can recognize what kind of brachiopod, for instance, uh, this might have been, we can quantify the amount of stretching and the amount of shortening in this direction uh, by uh, just measuring the aspect ratios and compare these aspect ratios with those of an unstrained brachiopod. And by this way we can uh, quantify the deformation or we simply can measure the elongation of uh, the brachiopod compared to a grown-up uh, brachiopod uh, in the unstrained way, which only would give us the longitudinal strain. In a similar way, we can measure shortening in areas where such a brachiopod would undergo horizontal shortening, contraction, or oblique shearing, as we see here in the bottom uh, image. Elongation, contraction, shear, all these we can quantify in numbers or in angles, angles quite uh, accurately. But uh, even if we do not have such strain markers where we know the unstrained shape and aspect ratios before deformation took place, there are statistical methods that allow us to quantify the strain. This is a fairly complicated method. We might talk about that at third year or at honors level. But uh, given, for instance, uh, the distribution of uh, conglomerates, in a, of pebbles in a conglomerate, you can determine from their relative uh, orientation to each other how much strain this conglomerate has experienced uh, after the deposition of the pebbles in a riverbed or in a beach conglomerate. So it's more complicated, but even if no such fossils or other strain markers with known previous shape uh, a present strain can be determined in uh, uh, some sophisticated uh, ways. Here we see various ways in which a strain can manifest itself. Uh, four different examples. The first one here would apply to a kind of strain that uh, reduces the volume, reduces the volume of a certain uh, rock body and uh, this is uh, something that uh, applies to isostatic conditions where forces act in all directions at the same magnitude. Uh, this is easiest to compare to um, any body, for instance a diver or a submarine or whatever, suspended uh, into an oceanic basin or a deep lake and uh, yeah, just put into deeper and deeper levels. The water pressure will act on such a body from all sides at equal magnitude. The same happens when you uh, are looking at different le levels of the crust, at deeper levels of the crust, you will experience higher pressure, higher stresses. In fact, that is the more appropriate term if we talk about uh, deformation. Uh, lithostatic pressure, lithostatic stress are acting in all directions at the same way. And uh, we have been talking about one situation where such volume um, dependent strain might occur and that is in subduction zones when you bring uh, upper material, lithospheric material from higher levels into deeper levels. Certain minerals will uh, convert at a certain depth with uh, the appropriate stress applied to them, pressure applied to them at this depth and convert into different mineral phases where um, atoms are usually moving closer together atom bondings are getting shortened and uh, the material reconfigures itself in a new high pressure mineral phase that is uh, more stable at such depth. This even can trigger earthquakes here in this kind of conversion zone in about five, six, seven hundred kilometers depth. So here we get a volume loss due to isostatic stress increase uh, at this depth. And a metamorphic reaction takes place, mineral phases get replaced by minerals that have a smaller volume. So deep earthquakes can be triggered by this kind of deformation. Then uh, looking at uh, 
contractional, collisional environments. Here we have horizontal shortening, crustal shortening that is typical, ref typically referring to this kind of setting where lithosphere is getting shortened laterally and thickens vertically. And uh, here we see our reference body, our blue starting conditions, how it shortens laterally and thickens vertically. This is a um, contractional setting. You should actually avoid this term in this context because compression refers to stress features. We are looking here at strain, at the actual change in shape. Horizontal shortening, vertical thickening. We are not looking at the forces that are responsible for this change in shape. So here we have a similar case. Uh, here it's talking about tension. Tension again is a stress-related term. It uh, simply means pulling laterally and uh, that is not what we are talking about here. We're actually talking about uh, the change in shape that is related to the pulling, that is a consequence of that pulling. And we see this here, for instance, in rift basins or uh, along mid-oceanic ridges, where we laterally stretch lithosphere. And in this case here, we clearly are thinning vertically while we are stretching laterally, forming uh, uh, basins, new sedimentary basins, uh, fault blocks, listric faults, all these features we have talked about in relationship to continental breakup. Again, this term should be replaced. We should talk about extension. Extension is a term that refers to the tectonics that go on, to the change in shape that we observe. And uh, since, we, since we are talking about strain features, we should be clear in our terminology. Also, shearing here that we see is a form of strain that we can measure, that we can see. We see the displacement of blocks along a strike-slip fault, for instance, like here, for instance, of course, the San Andreas Fault. In an American textbook, we would not see another one, but um, there are many other large strike slip falls. The West Fisher, for instance, in Chile is a, uh, certainly a structure of similar kind of magnitude. So the distortion of rock, the change of shape, all that refers to strains and different ways how strain might be manifested in rocks. The uh, terms stress and strain, as we have seen, are closely related, but they should not be confused with each other. Stress and strain are different things. The stress talks about the physical force that it is applied to rocks and that might, if it is strong enough, cause a rock to fail and undergo deformation. And this deformation and the strain uh, related to it is then a consequence of stresses high enough to exceed the strength of rocks and make them deform. If such stress is too weak, then no strain will occur. Stress is a feature, is a thing that is measured in pascals. The unit, the SI unit is pascals, but uh, in geological terms we normally uh, use at least kilopascals or megapascals. That's what it takes to deform rocks. Uh, with a pascal you will not do anything to a rock. So thousands or millions of pascals are typically seen units. Sometimes even gigapascals, billions of pascals, are referred to in the literature. So let's have a look. Uh, let's compare what stress can do to uh, material. And uh, this also comes from Marshak's textbook, this example. Let's think about a Coke tin, and we are talking about an empty tin, uh, which uh, you already have opened. Apply a uh, load of 70 kilograms uh, on top of it, and here on Earth with the uh, gravity field that we have, these 70 kilos would exert uh, a force of about uh, 687 newtons onto a certain surface. Here we see what a newton, how a newton is ref, uh, referring to stress, to pascals. Uh, one newton per square meter uh, equals one kilogram per meter times second squared. So these newtons are changing here, these units. And uh, yeah, that is what one pascal would be. 
687 newtons applied to the surface of such a can would produce a certain stress. And since uh, the surface area of such a tin is something in the range of 0.004 square meters, we are exerting a stress of 172 kilopascals onto such a tin. Normally such a tin would probably collapse. It can't take this amount of stress to, uh, and, and still remain stable. However, if we distribute now the load that we apply here, the 687 newtons, over a larger area, say 10 of such tins, then we will see the stress is significantly smaller, a tenth of it, 17.2 kilopascals. And uh, this stress can be taken by these 10 tins and they will remain stable. We are loading them, we are applying a certain stress, but we are not achieving any strain. Another matter is relevant in this context uh, when you step off this coke tin, obviously the strain shape will remain. So we have accumulated here by applying a certain stress a lasting, a permanent strain onto this body and uh, you can see that afterwards even if you do not see any more the evidence that stress is acting on it. You see the result, you see the feature and you can presume that once at the time when the strain was accumulated uh, that some stress was applied. When you look later at these unstrained tins, you will not be able to tell whether ever a small stress was acting on these tins or not because a no strain feature has affected them. This is exactly the same in natural rocks. Natural rocks uh, that have not undergone deformation certainly were uh, exposed to stress in the past, but this stress was not sufficiently large to uh, have a lasting imprint in the term of a deformation pattern. So always be aware when you look at deformation features you are talking about features of strain. You are describing the strain. You cannot easily describe the stresses that were responsible for it. If you see for instance such a coke tin it would be fairly difficult for you to tell how much stress was applied. The shape doesn't tell you anything about these 172 kilopascals. All that it tells you is that there was once a stress applied that was larger than the coke tin could take and that means a stress larger than the shear strength of your coke tin. With rocks it's, it's exactly the same. If you see uh, deformation features you know the rock was exposed to stress more to higher stress than it could take uh, in order to remain undeformed. So, summarizing this, stress is the physical force applied to a rock and this physical force might, if it's strong enough, cause a rock to respond by failure and undergo deformation. But the stress itself does not leave any physical trace in the rocks. You cannot see stress, features of stress, unless strain is uh, is present and deformations are present that allow you to conclude that once stress exceeded the strength of the rock. But still you are looking at deformation patterns. You are not looking at characteristics of stress. You are looking at characteristics of deformation, of the way the rock responded. So it is important that in your communication you are clean with your, with your technical terms. If you are talking about features related to stress. That means to the forces that have caused certain deformation to take place or just have put load on rocks and the rock might not have um, responded with permanent strain. You will talk about compression or compressive stresses or about tension or tensile stresses to which you expose a sample or a rock or a region in the field. With strain, this is different. With strain, you will expect to see visible features that uh, typically are deformation structures such as fractures, or joints, or folds, or folds, or ductile shear zones, and we will talk about them in, uh, for the rest of this course and uh, also at later levels in your education. And terms relating to strain, they 
encapsulate already that something has happened. Contraction, as opposed to compression, implies that shortening has happened. Extension also means something has been extended, not only pulled, like tensile stress. You haven't only pulled, uh, some stretching and elongation has taken place in order to accommodate and to respond to the tensile forces that you might expose any kind of material to. Or you can refer to volume loss, volume gain or shear strain as we see it down here. These are visible features that have imprinted the rock and, and that you can conclude and see and, and verify and measure. And indirectly this allows you also to uh, postulate that stresses must have acted and uh, stresses must have uh, been large enough to achieve this kind of strain. Again, stress is the causing force, the strain is the visible effect of a force large enough to cause such a visible effect. But these are two different things. Let's talk about the two principal ways in which uh, rocks can deform, can be deformed and can respond to large stresses. In uh, very simplistic terms we can distinguish between materials that are fairly hard and brittle. They break if, uh, if you apply enough stress. And other material, soft material, that you also can deform, that can change shape, that will flow without breaking if you apply large stresses. And, and here we see our uh, very simple textbook examples, uh, a plate, uh, ceramic or glass plate that you drop will fracture. It will fall apart into individual fragments and that is what we refer to as brittle deformation. Whereas soft material like a lump of dough can be loaded with a certain load and we see this here. Just put a textbook on it or similar weight and uh, you will see also the dough lump uh, does, the, does deform, it does change its shape but it's doing so without breaking. It flows, it flows plastically and that is what we call ductile deformation. In different contexts you will see uh, the term ductile deformation or plastic deformation. For now we can take these two terms as synonymous. Strictly speaking they are not identical but uh, for now they are so similar that we can talk about either ductile or um, plastic strain. What are the typical features of brittle and uh, plastic deformation? We have seen yeah, the hard material breaks and uh, we achieve change in shape by fragmentation and between these individual fragments there is no longer cohesion. They are not sticking together anymore as they were in the original unstrained shape. And these individual fragments, they move apart from each other and uh, you cannot easily put them together. So loss of cohesion has taken place within the fragments, in between the fragments. This is clearly different in plastic behavior. In plastic behavior you change the shape without fragmentation and therefore without loss of cohesion. You can think about uh, how temperature for instance would change the behavior of these materials if you have for instance a glass plate that you heat up to high temperature and uh, you know uh, that you can uh, easily reshape glass if it is uh, hot glowing, it's a soft material. So if you have such a hot glass plate maybe six, seven hundred degrees hot, uh, then you might be able to drop it and it will not break. It just will change shape plastically. Or if you deep freeze a lump of dough and uh, you will crystallize all the water that is contained in small droplets in such a dough, you will find that this dough becomes very hard. And if you take a sledgehammer and uh, apply sufficient load, you probably will be able to break the dough into individual fragments. So clearly uh, temperature is a parameter that influences the way material will respond to stress. It's the same with rocks. Rocks that will readily break 
under surface conditions. Virtually all rocks would do so. Uh, if they are cold, they break. You have to apply force. You take your hammer, you break off a piece. If such rocks uh, are under mid or lower crustal uh, con physical conditions, high temperatures, 5, 600, maybe 800 degrees, you will find that these rocks become very soft. And under such conditions, they will respond to stress in very different way. They might undergo ductile shearing, they might undergo folding, for instance. And so you can turn around this information. If you see a fold in the field, you can already conclude that this rock during deformation must have been hot enough to respond to stress with plastic deformation. And for each rock type there is a certain critical temperature that must have been exceeded in order to let the rock respond in a plastic manner by ductile deformation to a certain stress. This is a way how geologists read information from features in the field. They see a certain behavior and they would say, okay, deformation must have occurred at a certain minimum temperature in order, for instance, to produce these folds that we see here. This is a marble, a layered marble, and uh, here these uh, very beautiful uh, ductile folds. Uh, they require a certain minimum temperature to, uh, to form, and uh, plasticity of marble, of the mineral calcite, or dolomite that makes up this rock, will um, yeah, start at four, maybe 500 degrees to be sufficiently soft to form such deformation patterns. If the temperature would be lower, maybe only 200 degrees, uh, this rock would readily break and produce fractures. Such as here on this side. Here we see a rock has undergone jointing. We see here these traces of one joint set running in this direction and another one is running straight towards us. So these are fractures in rocks and this rock has responded to stress by breaking. And uh, given the rock type that we see, we would assume that uh, this rock was colder probably than 300 degrees when this jointing took place. Maybe substantially colder, 100 or 50 degrees at the time of fracturing. This does not preclude that this rock might have been at higher temperature before jointing took place, but uh, we can bind the deformation event here to a certain low temperature uh, at, uh, at which it must have occurred. So let's summarize uh, the characteristics of brittle and ductile deformation. Uh, brittle deformation leads to fracturing and that requires that atom bondings are breaking along planar, more or less planar surfaces. Most fractures are reasonably planar, depending on scale you look at them, but uh, if you look here at these joints they are fairly straight and in three dimensions they are more or less planar structures. We need to break all atom bondings along such surfaces in order to establish a fracture. That results in the loss of cohesion between the two fragments that have broken apart from each other. And this strain is permanent. It cannot be undone. Once you form a fracture, it exists. Ductile deformation is different in that regard. In ductile deformation, not all bonds, atomic bonds, break along planar or non-planar surface at the same time, but uh, what we see here is a process at crystal and in fact at atom scale, where atom bondings are opening and reconfiguring uh, one by one fairly quickly so that we never have the situation that along a larger surface area um, atom bondings are broken. They are snapping and closing quickly enough and that you know, prevents cohesion to be lost. So bonds between individual atoms can open but very quickly they get attached to a different atom and uh, so no large-scale loss of cohesion is uh, occurring and permanent strain is acquired in uh, such a successive process, in such an evolutionary process that uh, you will see and will learn uh, happens at atom scale within individual crystals, cumulatively changing the shape of rocks. Then there's a third type of deformation and we have already mentioned it, elastic deformation.
um, seismic waves, for instance, they propagate by elastic deformation. And here, no atom bonds are getting broken, they only get stretched. They are getting stretched and bent while such a seismic wave passes through or while a load is put on a rock that is insufficiently large to break it or to cause plastic deformation. So this change in shape, uh, and uh, you will agree that uh, surface moves during an earthquake, this change in shape is non-permanent. It is undone as soon as a seismic wave has passed through or as soon in deeper parts of the rock, as soon as a differential stress field, uh, stress field is uh, getting weaker or disappears. Um, and, uh, and this elastic deformation then will be recovered. This is a form of non-permanent strain, strain that we cannot detect if, uh, if we sample such a rock. Many rocks that uh, you sample and that have no visible evidence of deformation taken place, they might have undergone elastic deformation in the past. You cannot tell from a rock that you collect in the field whether, for instance, a seismic wave passed through that rock in the geological past. No visible expression of this is uh, recovered because the strain is elastic. Here are a number of controlling factors that uh, are important in this regard. Temperature, pressure and depth, deformation rate and rock composition. We will talk about this in the next lecture. Thank you very much.